So yeah, um, I'll be chairing session two, um, which is on global vaccination context and different approaches. So um, the first speaker that we have is Alexandra Hogan from Imperial College London, and she'll be speaking on optimal vaccine allocation strategies within and between countries. So I don't know, is Alexandra there and able to um, yeah. uh, switch on her video? Great. Okay. Um, just center mode. Okay. So, um, uh, thank you uh, very much to the organisers of this um, seminar for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and um, yeah, I've certainly really enjoyed all of the the talk so far. Um, I am, yeah, I'm a uh, currently a research fellow at Imperial College London, um, but I'm actually speaking from Australia, so I've just moved back to my home country um, of Australia, and I'll be starting a position at the University of um, New South Wales uh, in the new year. So um, today, yes, I'll be talking about um, different strategies and, and ways of thinking about allocation of vaccine doses. Uh, for COVID, I guess, uh, globally, so between countries and also within countries, so some different questions around that. Um, and so we've already heard a bit about this this morning, so I don't think I need to go into too much um, background about how the delivery of vaccines has really evolved over the past year or so. But really, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, and even before we had any vaccines available, there was a lot of um, ongoing questions and discussions about you know, once these vaccines become available, who should be prioritised for vaccine delivery and how should they be allocated? Um, so there was uh, lots of research that, that went on, and we've heard about some of this already, about allocation within countries. So should we prioritise healthcare workers, the elderly, um, different priority groups, uh, and so on. Um, and then also questions about um, equitable and efficient global distribution of vaccine doses. So um, how we allocate um, doses between different countries or income settings, for example. Um, and then the COVAX facility was set up to sort of help, help address that concern. And then how to allocate doses once a program is underway or as the pandemic evolves. So we're seeing those questions now with um, how to allocate booster doses. So I'm going to say, um, uh, a few things about sort of questions two and three that I've flagged there. Um, so first I'll talk a bit about this um, question of efficient global distribution of vaccines. So first, um, just to introduce our overall model and our modelling approach. So this is a um, SARS-CoV-2 transmission model that's been developed you know, since the beginning of the pandemic by the, the um, team at Imperial College. And um, I won't go into too much detail, but basically it's an SEIRS type compartmental model with the hospitalisation and severe disease and death pathway as well. So some of the models that we've already seen models like this today. Um, this is an age structure deterministic model with 17 five year age groups. Um, we have things such as age dependent disease uh, severity and uh, setting specific healthcare capacity. And importantly, we incorporate vaccination by replicating all of these disease compartments across um, our different vaccine states. So from unvaccinated to vaccinated, but not protected, vaccinated, then protected, and then previously vaccinated. So at the time that um, we developed this model, and this is just the work that I'll talk about first, uh, we didn't actually have a vaccine available yet. So we were looking at sort of broad categories of um, efficacy against infection, uh, against disease and against transmission um, for a sort of an unknown, uh, unknown vaccine characteristics at that time. Um, this model is also fully open source as an R package, so you can download and, and use it. So some of the things that um, we can change in this model, which become important in terms of how we kind of formulated uh, our research questions, are that we can set um, different patterns um, of mixing between age groups based on contact studies from different settings. Uh, we can also include demography, so the age structure. 
of the population. And then we can set uh, setting specific healthcare capacity, so for hospital beds and ICU beds, and age and healthcare dependent um, COVID-19 mortality from some, some quite well established data on that now. Um, and so what this sort of led us to do was to think about, so you know, when we're considering this global issue of, of COVID vaccine dose allocation, um, in you know, lots of the work that has been done and that we've done, we've sort of looked at you know, very specific country settings and looked at um, you know, what has been the experience in that particular country to date, and then what do we predict about how the pandemic will evolve going forward. Um, but then trying to do that for every country in the world to think about a global picture of vaccine impact um, becomes really challenging because of the diversity of experience and in, in how the pandemic has been experienced differently. So what we did was we thought, well, let's um, what we'll do is sort of a, a sort of simpler way of looking at this is to divide up uh, countries in the world by income settings. So we looked at the four you know, characteristic income settings of high income, um, upper middle, lower middle and low income countries. And we basically divided up the world's population into this crude um, four categories. And then what we did was we took um, a characteristic um, contact pattern of mixing, um, uh, the demography of the median uh, GDP country within that income setting, and also uh, some assumptions about uh, healthcare capacity um, and disease progression with treatment in those in those settings. And um, this all this sort of way of um, structuring, I guess, the global setting was also um, published in Walker et al. In, in their science paper. And so then we can use all these things to parameterize our compartmental model and use that to, to think about um, impact of vaccines. So I won't go into all of the details of you know, how we parameterize this and the different sorts of runs that we did, but um, I guess just to summarize it briefly, we came up with um, a characteristic trajectory of transmission so that we you know, captured an initial um, large wave of transmission earlier in the in the pandemic and then a period of suppression and then we simulated vaccines being delivered at the beginning of 2021 and then after a population has received their vaccines we lift um, our reproduction number or RT which is our sort of proxy for capturing um, interventions in the population and we lift that so that we let transmission increase and then we measure what the impact um, of vaccination is. And so what we did was we said, okay, so we want to um, try and measure the impact or quantify the impact of vaccination um, in these four income settings. Uh, let's take the 2 billion doses um, that have been promised through the COVAX facility and we'll roll those out in 2021 and calculate the impact if those 2 billion doses have been divided up globally in different ways. And so we looked at, um, First, uh, what if countries had been allocated these 2 billion doses according uh, relative to their population size? We then looked at if countries allocated those doses relative to population size, but within that individual 65 years and older are always targeted first for vaccination. And we also looked at if high income countries can access doses first. Um, so we prioritise the high income countries first. And then we use this to calculate the total number of deaths averted per million population and the total deaths averted per 100 fully vaccinated people. So um, I guess two measures of effective, effectiveness of vaccines and also the efficiency of, of that approach. And what we found here was that um, it really is a, a good idea to allocate doses according to population size and that allocating globally according to population size is actually uh, Bit better than, than if all of the high income countries uh, take all the vaccine doses. And within that, if you then allocate according to the highest risk of severe disease within those countries, um, that is going to be the most efficient approach globally in terms of averting you know, the, most, the most deaths. So then we also thought, well, what would a, an optimised solution look like? Say that we would theoretically allocate doses in this in, a, in an optimal way um, to avert the most deaths. You know, how would that look? 
and what would the impact be compared to say this this best scenario that we've identified here so what we did was we simulated our vaccine impact again in the way that i described um, across all of the sort of five-year targeted age groups within the model and for each income setting we calculated the deaths of burden and then we used um, an optimization uh, package in R to identify the global uh, optimal vaccine strategy. So that's going back to our fixed scenarios before. So our optimized scenario that um, it came up with was one that um, averted say 1.43 deaths per 100 fully vaccinated versus our 1.2, which was the best scenario that we'd, we'd identified ourselves. So this optimal allocation is a little bit better, but not a huge amount better than than um, you know than a, a equitable strategy. And um, what we also saw within that was that this algorithm will tell us within all these country allocations um, should those doses be allocated to the highest risk or to the working age um, population in sort of a herd impact strategy. And most of the time. Um, direct protection of the highest risk groups or the elderly uh, was, was going to be the optimal solution. And that's really in line with some of the work we've seen today and in, in particular what um, Mark was describing earlier. So I think that's, that's certainly been found by other groups. Um, and in terms of, it was interesting also to see where those doses were allocated globally and the majority of global doses were allocated to the high income, but also the lower middle income settings. And that's to do with a combination of um, the size of the population at highest risk uh, of severe disease and death, but also assumptions about uh, the healthcare capacity in the lower um, income countries as well. Um, and all of that work is published um, in our paper in, in Vaccine there. So um, in terms of, I'll just move on now to talk about sort of some of our uh, recent work, which is um, actually we've just been working on in the past couple of weeks, which is about how um, to allocate doses once a vaccine program is underway. Um, in particular, thinking about um, what the best approach is in terms of, of allocating booster doses. And I guess to give a, a bit of a picture here, uh, I think this plot's uh, only a few weeks old. Um, is seeing how you know following we, we we knew that you know we all know that a, a, an equitable strategy where, where doses are allocated fairly globally uh, would be the best approach but but you know broadly it has been the high income countries that have um, been able to access the majority of vaccine doses so with less than five percent in low income countries having received one dose um, so there's there's quite stark inequities there So looking ahead, um, now we've seen some countries with quite early vaccine, vaccination uptake and you know, high levels of vaccine access, we're already seeing evidence of waning. Um, from what the studies show so far, that waning is um, much more pronounced against mild disease or sort of asymptomatic infection and broadly uh, efficacy against you know, severe disease and death is maintained, but we are still seeing some drops in, in that efficacy against severe disease. Um, importantly, booster doses have shown significant impact both in trials and we're also starting to see data from real, real world efficacy there as well. In the what I'm talking about today, I'll also talk about that in the context of Omicron as well, um, since this is you know the um, I guess the main issue at the moment. So in the UK, we've seen really rapid growth, um, consistent with an RT above what we've seen for Delta, um, and now we're in we're in a situation where there's quite widespread global identification of Omicron, and we expect now that Omicron is going to quite rapidly replace the Delta variant. Um, there's still a lot of questions around um, disease uh, severity in terms of disease severity of Omicron relative to Delta. And it's also um, been shown that uh, neutralising antibody titers are substantially reduced, although different, um, there's a range of different estimates of, of fold uh, decrease in those titers. Um, broadly, what this is showing is that it looks like um, booster doses are going to be needed to sort of boost protection um, 
against the new variant. So now I'll talk about our approach um, into how we're thinking about this problem and, and the modeling we've done on this, this topic. So recently, um, some of you have probably seen it, there was some really nice work published by Jay Bukuri um, and also by Deborah Cromer, who are at the Kirby Institute uh, at UNSW in Australia. And they looked at uh, modeling the decay and boost of neutralizing antibody titer over time. And then linking that to a model um, of a logistic relationship between this antibody titer and protective efficacy. So this gives us a way to um, simulate um, this correlate of protection over time and how it relates to different efficacy endpoints. So I've shown the equation of efficacy there and then how this can um, be modeled to present, uh, to represent the neutralizing antibody titer over time. And you can see uh, it begins at the first dose and then it, we can capture this boost at the second dose and then boost at the, the booster dose or the third dose again as well. And then that um, relates to a vaccine efficacy against infection and then uh, a vaccine efficacy against severe disease. Um, and this is really useful in a modeling sense because it allows us to capture um, individual variability in immune response to uh, vaccination and also to infection. And also we can capture the correlation between each individual's um, antibody titer at each dose. So an individual with a lower starting titer would have um, subsequent lower titles at the, at the next doses. And so this is an example here just for a single vaccine, um, but we can capture this for, for multiple you know, different vaccine products or different combinations of doses. So uh, this shows here some work that we've been doing on fitting these antibody and efficacy profiles to data from the UK. Um, and I've just shown one example here, but, but this is still you know, being updated as, as new data emerges as well. Um, and this can be used then to understand the impact of waning immunity. So, and then allows us to sort of infer how booster doses will be valuable at the population level. Another um, piece of work that so Deborah Cromer and, and her team have, have done as well is then further extended this model to show how it can capture the impact of, of new variants. So they've used this to show how estimated um, fold drop in antibody titer. So here they've got uh, fold drops of between four and eight to look at how the neutralizing antibody titer is reduced um, for say um, the alpha, beta, gamma, delta variants um, relative to wild type. And so we can apply this fold reduction as well in our model um, that we've parameterized here of antibody titer and efficacy, and then apply a fold drop to represent um, the reduced impact of vaccines against uh, the Omicron variant. So what we've now done is incorporated this model of um, antibody uh, titer and boosting within an individual base model of SARS-CoV-2 transmission. So this model um, pretty much mirrors the epidemiological structure of that deterministic model that I presented earlier. Um, so you can say the similar kind of flow diagram there, um, but it does have very flexible dose and age uh, prioritization strategy options for allocating vaccines in the model. Um, you can simulate any number of booster doses after the primary series. It incorporates this model of individual level antibody titer and decay uh, linked to efficacy, and that can be parameterized um, by the user. So you see fit or changed for different uh, vaccine products. It then allows us to capture that individual variation in the response to vaccination. Um, yeah, specific vaccine products, and it's also quite quick and extensible. So this model uh, now is fully source, uh, fully open source as an R package, so you can download it um, on GitHub. And this was developed by uh, Giovanni Charles at, at Imperial and also Sean Wu, um, who uh, was from Berkeley, and now at IHME, who uh, developed this package. So we've used uh, this individual based model to look at um, 
different transmission scenarios uh, for COVID, and then to look at different options of rolling out the primary series of doses and then adding on different options for boosting uh, age groups in the population. So I won't go into detail about you know, the full parameterization of the model. This is all sort of, um, this is actually really work in progress at the moment. So, um, so um, any of these results could change slightly, but it just gives you a broad sense of uh, some of the overall findings and the way that I guess we're thinking about um, addressing these questions. Um, here are some uh, model trajectories for um, daily deaths per million of from COVID. This is in a high income and upper middle income settings here. And so what we can do is simulate sort of the initial trajectory from the beginning of the pandemic. And then uh, from 2021, we gradually roll out vaccines at a sort of constant rate of vaccinating the population per week, and then look at the impact of say adding on um, booster doses and so on. So in these different scenarios here, we've looked at um, vaccinating the 15 years plus population uh, over time, and then looking at um, the adding on of booster doses, which is the purple and then um, booster doses. Uh, so the, the purple is booster doses in 60 years plus, and then the blue is, is boosters in the entire population. And so, um, underneath in those bar charts, we've shown total deaths per million since the start of vaccination, and then uh, total deaths averted per 100 doses. So um, overall, you can see that we're capturing quite a big impact of booster doses, um, which is in line with what we're starting to see in the data that's emerging, but also that it's uh, most efficient really to target booster doses to that um, most vulnerable population. And what this model is also capturing is that the most vulnerable in the population, or say the 60 years and above, they're the ones that were vaccinated earliest in the pandemic because of the age prioritization approach uh, that we simulate in the model. Um, so they're the ones that are having their immunity start to wane earliest. So we're capturing that benefit there. Uh, so much minutes I've got left. Um, so going forward in this analysis, we're starting to look at sort of three categories. So the first is uh, substantial past epidemics with high vaccine coverage. And so we're thinking about high income settings that have had you know, lots of vaccines and we're wanting to know what is the value in giving booster doses and to who. Um, the second category that we've looked at is countries with substantial past transmission but say moderate to low vaccination coverage. And the question here is, um, if you've you know, vaccinated part of your population, should you then start to go and boost the most vulnerable people in the population? Or should you use those doses to um, roll out vaccines to the younger age groups? And then we've looked at uh, zero COVID countries, um, which, uh, we're looking at you know, countries that have successfully suppressed transmission to date and looking at rolling out doses and then they're opening up strategies, which I might run out of talk, time to talk about that one today. So here looking at uh, that first question, substantial past transmission, um, we use this model to simulate some different trajectories for, for the transmission number shown on the left there and then rolled out vaccine doses um, and boosters to different age groups. So this is shown here in terms of um, impact in those different age groups on the left. And you can see that booster doses in the elderly are making quite a substantial difference um, in dampening what we've simulated here as an Omicron type wave. Looking at the second um, scenario, which was the lower middle income um, settings with partial vaccine coverage, what we did here was we wanted to compare two scenarios um, with the same number of doses. So what we did was we rolled out vaccines uh, to the 60 plus years group. After that, we paused and then either um, continued rolling out vaccines to younger age groups or took those same amount of doses and went back and started vaccinating the oldest age groups again with a booster, but overall using up the same number of doses. 
And what we found, which is shown in um, these bar charts here, is that pretty much again, across all of the scenarios that we looked at, it was always more advantageous to give booster doses to the 60 plus population, rather than continuing vaccinating uh, younger age groups with the primary series. And I think that's really driven by um, the highest risk of mortality in, in the older age groups, but also the timing of their vaccine relative to the timing of a subsequent epidemic if those um, oldest individuals had been vaccinated first. Um, I'll finally, I've got one more slide on, on countries with no past epidemic. Um, and what we did was look at um, three different scenarios for lifting. So lifting prior to boosters being delivered, um, lifting after boosters have been delivered to the 60 plus years or lifting after boosters have been delivered to everyone. And this is shown here, and I guess I'll just draw your attention to say the, this um, second row on the left hand side is if lifting is delivered after um, boosters are given to um, the 60 year plus. And I think that's clearly the most suppressed or the dampened peak. And that's really being driven by um, the timing of the wave being immediately after the most vulnerable people in the population have been have been um, revaccinated or boosted. So I think that's um, the end of my talk. I'd just like to um, acknowledge all of the people that have worked on this. So it was quite a big team at Imperial um, and with some other collaborators as well. And all of that code's uh, available online and, and same as um, some of the past scientific reports. Um, and thank you and I'm happy to answer some questions. And these photos here are of my most recent COVID experience, which was when we recently moved back to Australia, we spent two weeks in um, the Australian quarantine facility up in the Northern Territory. So that's, that's where those photos are from. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alexandra. Um, I think we have time for a question and Sam Brand has written a question in the